Hello students and welcome to today's lecture on um, six characters in search of an author. This is a play written by Luigi Pirandello. Uh, you won't be surprised to find out he's an Italian playwright from the early part of the 20th century. This play was originally put on in 1921. At first it was hated, and in fact uh, Pirandello famously had to duck out of the theater with his daughter to avoid the uh, angry theater goers at the end of the initial performance. But now people really love this play, and it's it's going to be an example of meta theater, something we've already talked about, and it's a play that really engages with uh, questions about reality and illusion. So what's real and what's just represented? So our literary concepts this week, we're going to talk about mise-en-scene, which is a French phrase, I'll tell you what that means in a second. We'll also talk about theatrical realism and symbolism, and where we fit uh, verisimilitude into that discussion. So first of all, mise-en-scene uh, are the design aspects of theater or film production. So it basically means um, the visual theme of, of a production like this. It includes things like set design, lighting, space, composition, costume, makeup and hair, acting, actors. Everything that you see when you see a play, that's all part of the mise-en-scene. So you can impress people by using this term uh, whenever you're talking about theater or film. I want to talk about theatrical realism and symbolism here as, as literary ideas. So let's start with the realism. It was a general movement in 19th century theater that developed a set of dramatic and theatrical conventions with the aim of bringing a greater fidelity of real life to texts and performances. So these qualities often included a focus on everyday middle-class drama, ordinary speech, and ordinary settings. You might think for a moment about a play like Death of a Salesman as one that engaged in some of these conventions. We certainly have an ordinary drama and everyday speech, for instance. Of course, Miller's choices in how to represent that drama push that play in some different directions, but we can see how his characters and his plot are very realistic. They seem like things that could actually happen. You may have noticed that both our plays last week lacked things like soliloquies, you know, where a character talks to no one, or asides, where people sort of say out loud what they're thinking. Um, those are some of the elements of realistic theater. We don't have those things. At, at this time, acting moved away from theatrical artifice, you know, great big broad gestures, and towards something we might recognize as the way people actually behave. So that's kind of an idea of what theatrical realism is about. Um, verisimilitude is the representational goal of realistic theater, so verisimilitude just means true seeming. Uh, it, realistic theater wants to put you in a place that you'll recognize in someone's living room and let you forget to the extent that you can that you're watching a play. The social goal of realism was to use the five senses and a scientific approach to reality to solve serious human problems. This kind of strong social purpose is, is the opposite of Oscar Wilde's aestheticism. Remember, that was the art for art's sake movement. You might think here uh, on this social uh, problem focus that realism often had, you might think about what Liv uh, Linda said about Willie, right? That Willie's a human being who's suffering and therefore attention must be paid. So if, if you want to kind of put realistic theater uh, or theatrical realism in a nutshell, you could say that it wanted to turn the stage into a living room. Baudrillard might kind of say this kind of realism is at the sacramental order of images. There's a faithful representation between the signs presented on stage and the reality to which they refer. As a quick point to which I'll return in part three of this lecture, Pirandello was also done with symbolism, the other branch of theatrical experiment at the end of the 19th century. So the symbolists, as opposed to the realists, the symbolists wanted to, um, instead of faithfully representing the historical and social situation of characters, the symbolists wanted the mise-en-scene of the play to come about totally in the spectator's mind. So the words of the author were thus, uh, thus were to enable the symbolist spectator to visualize the evoked scene. So um, realism and symbolism were both attempts to uh, uh, work with the stage to get beyond some of the theatrical, um, heavily stylized performances that we see earlier in the history of theater. And so here we have these two images, the one on the left, um, probably pretty straightforwardly realistic, and the one on the right, maybe much more kind of uh, symbolic. So today with Pirandello, we're going to see kind of a, uh, a reversal of that relationship of, um, of, of the stage in the living room, let's say. 
So when Pirandello um, wrote this play, he was really through with modern realism. The literal scene, the actual individuals, and the sensational events of individual lives, they no longer seem to have any form or meaning. But when uh, he senses, when he, when he found the analogy between his problem uh, as an artist and the problems of his characters who were seeking form and meaning, he had the clue to his new theatrical form and to the peculiar sense of human action as itself theatrical which this form was to realize. So instead of giving us real characters and events, Pirandello gives us char characters who constantly relive their particular moments of crisis over and over, and who dispute the meanings of those events each time they're re-enacted. By this means, he found a mode of action in which he um, and the actors and the characters and the audience could all sort of participate together. Uh, and they could share by analogy, which and 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 this this um, this mode could thus be a clue to the formal relationships and the temporal order of the plays he puts on. So instead of working as the author who digests all this material, this plot, and these characters for us, Pirandello presents us with the very working out of these problems. Instead of representing life in theater, he wants to represent for us and with us the theatricality of life. Pirandello saw this as a way to raise these events from mere representation to contemplation. The stage, instead of being mistaken for a living room, becomes a place where the truth of the different characters is contested. So what comes out of this? One result is that the characters are the results of their experience, but they are also participants in its presentation. Pay attention to the father. He's a character with real suffering first, but he's also a rationalized platform a product of what happens when he gets to dramatize that experience on stage second. Another result is the re-examination of the relationship between art and life, one that doesn't easily resolve that relationship as sign and referent or image and reality. In Pirandello's hands, the stage gets to be the stage itself. It doesn't have to be a copy of offstage scenes. By letting the stage be itself, his six characters may move from the realm of sacramental representation into the realm of the simulacrum. That's something we can return to later.